Hey man, you know the Emmanuel band is like the kickoff team on the, on the football field, you know? They set the tone. Yeah, and you got to just put the craziest people on the kickoff team, right? Yeah, these guys, thank you for plowing the way. Yes. One day my hair's going to look like Eric's and I'm going to drum like that too. Probably in the new heavens and the new earth though. Now, uh, welcome to Emmanuel Nashville. If we've not met, I'm Pastor TJ Timms, lead pastor here at Emmanuel, and I would love to meet you after the service. Just hear how you got here, um, whatever else you want to talk about. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 today. It's on page 976 in a Bible on a chair back near you. And I'm going to read starting with verse 1. But before we get there, I want to think briefly with you about the lead up to the new year. It's almost 2023, which is crazy. And uh, there's a lot happening between now and the new year, so let me walk, walk us through that. Um, now, you'll notice that there's a holiday calendar available if you use the QR code on the back of your seat that has a lot of this stuff on it. But next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, which is to say the first of four Sundays leading up to Christmas, anticipating the Advent or the coming of our Lord um, first time. And we'll be giving out an Advent devotional book written by uh, Pastor John Piper uh, for all of those who would like a, a free resource for um, just focusing on Jesus as we lead up to Christmas. I mean, we have all these things just sort of bearing down on us, all these, Sam and I were talking about that this morning. Uh, you know, there's no time of year that we so pressurize as Christmas. And there's hardly a time of year that we feel more isolated than the holidays, which is a kind of terrible irony because it's God coming to us. So we want to move closer together. We want to hyper-focus on Jesus. And if this uh, resource would help you to do that, then please come next Sunday to, to get that. And how I plan to use it, so you know, is um, in the morning or in the evening, uh, together, uh, Jessica, my wife, and our four kids around us, and to attempt to communicate something about the joy and beauty of Jesus to them, because uh, our kids are young, and, you know, sit down and hear Dad preach is not their favorite moment of the day. That's okay, because here's what we're communicating. The purpose of reality is the enjoyment of the glory of God. So maybe they never remember a single sermon I preach at home. Here's what they'll remember. Mom and dad enjoyed Jesus. And if that's all they leave our home with is just a sense that Jesus is someone to be lived for and enjoyed, then they'll go learn the catechism questions we should have taught them themselves. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to encourage all of you other parents to just, you know, just throw up a shot and enjoy Jesus. And don't worry about it landing. The Lord will take care of that. So that's available next Sunday. Then on Friday, December 9th, starting at 5.30 p.m., we'll begin our Carol Fest festivities. And also at 6 o'clock, uh, so there'll be like hot dogs and hot chocolate on the grill and stuff. You know what I mean. Um... <laughs> Then we'll have the uh, Kids Carol Fest Christmas Cookie Cook-Off, or something like that. We originally had planned to go for a kind of great British baking show theme, but then Sam couldn't be there. Barnabas and I's British accents are rubbish. Uh, so it's like that, only with <laughs> amen, Sam says. Uh, so it's like that, but not. And Barnabas is going to be judging. His palate for cookies is... Uh, is just superb, I'm told. Is that fair, Barnabas? Yeah. Uh, there'll be some other judges who actually know a good cookie when they taste it. And um, we're going to give some prizes away to be determined, right? Yeah. Now, for the littler kids, it's like we know that there needs to be some parental involvement. For the older kids, though, we're saying like, yeah, no, cheating. no cheating. Yeah. So, wow us. Um, it's going to be fun. Then at 6.30, we'll start our, uh, our Carol Fest um, singing, and we've got some fun stuff planned for that night. I'm really excited about it. 
We need to have fun together, right? It's so deeply human. <laughs> God made the world that way. And there's some things we do here at Emmanuel that have really no other agenda other than fun with each other in the presence of God. Uh, this is one of them. So I hope that you show up there. Now, um, then on Christmas Eve, we'll have our Holy Communion service starting at 4 p.m. We moved it earlier in the evening this year for, uh, to have mercy on all of those parents who have trampolines to put together that evening. And then on Christmas morning, which is a Sunday this year, we'll have a single service at 1045. You can come in your pajamas, uh, bring a toy with you if you want. Uh, the sermon will be shorter than 45 minutes. And we'll have a great time celebrating Jesus. It'll be like our living room. So just come, make this your living room. Don't even worry about what you look like. All right, just, just come. Okay. All right, now, uh, so that's leading up to the new year. And uh, the, the uh, oh, the last thing to say is on our Carol Fest, can we go back to that? Um, one of the things that we really, uh, one of the privileges we have as a church is we uh, participate with Park Avenue Elementary School, which is two blocks over and just uh, loving them and helping them to love children. And Park Avenue Elementary School has, uh, more so than a lot of uh, metro schools, has a lot of need. And um, they are collecting shoes and jackets uh, for kids and for families. And one of the, th the w things that we want to do, one of the ways you can participate is to bring a pair of shoes, a kid's uh, boy or girl, or bring a jacket, um, you know, like little kids all the way up to adults, uh, so that uh, we can supply them with a way to help uh, families this time of year. And also, if you can't do either of those things, then just come prepared to give at the Carol Fest because we just want to love our neighbors well. We want Park Avenue Elementary School two blocks away to know that Emmanuel Nashville has their back. And that this is one way that we can do that. So, um, Carol Fest. Now, the last thing is an end of your giving update. Uh, many of you have asked that you be kept in the loop about where we are. Our, our annual budget is, um, our, what we're shooting for is 2.1 there. Giving as of today is 1.6-ish. And the balance you see there at the bottom, 462. And I, I just want to say that if we're going to hit our budget, you know, we, we got to ramp up. And because you've asked, that's, that's where we stand. Uh, but I hasten to add that in this year of crazy inflation, in the past two years of just like crazy hikes in living costs here in Nashville especially, uh, amid much uncertainty, we have also, in addition to that, given as a church more than $800,000 this year to our 10th generation campaign. So even though we're behind budget, we've actually given more as a church uh, than ever before. And here's why that means so much to me. Our, our giving, especially to the 10th generation campaign, says we believe in the future that God has for Emmanuel Nashville. And I am, I just want to say to you, I have nothing but gratitude and admiration for you to be among you is a privilege. The existence of a Christian church in this world that's not rallying to politics or anything else any lesser agenda than the glory of Christ. The existence of that church, its ongoing regular existence is a miracle. Thank you. Let's just keep going. If we don't make budget, we don't make budget and the elders will adjust responsibly. But let's just keep going. The Apostle Paul says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So, thank you. That's my spiel. Um, now, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. We're going to look at verse 10, though. I'm going to start with verse 1 because I want you to see how verse 1 and verse 10 bookend this amazing section in the book of Ephesians and how they're speaking to one another. So see if you can pick up on that. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, 
carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that you would enliven us by your living word, that you would impart to us a sense of your withness in us, and that you would energize us with a sense of our destiny in Christ Jesus. So that we leave here today confident, settled, assured, energized to live for Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. In the last five years, there's been a tremendous resurgence in the practice of astrology, which is the idea that by studying the movements of the planets and the stars, we can somehow discern or gain insight into our destiny. It's not a new idea, of course. Uh, We've been looking to the stars ever since we looked away from God. And surely one of the reasons we continue to do so today, despite all of our advancements in science and in reasoning, is because we can't shake the sense that to be human is to have a destiny. And that to be fully human, we must discover our destiny. I talked to a lot of people who moved to Nashville for careers related to music, and when I asked them why they moved here, they don't use words like reasonable or practical to describe what brought them here. They use words like passion, and dream, and even destiny. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Artist. Yeah, heads in the clouds. But it's not just the artists that speak like that. I know lawyers and entrepreneurs who are just as romantic about their work. You ask them why they made that move, why they went to that school, why they started that business, you'll hear the same kinds of words, passions, dreams, desire. And that's the desire inside of all of us that I want to appeal to today, the desire for destiny. Because that desire was put there by God. That longing inside of us all, it might be misguided, but the desire itself is a result of being created in the image of God and for God. It's a result of being human. And what I want to show you this morning is that no one so wants you to live with a sense of destiny as Jesus does. So one verse, two points, and then just a concluding practical question. That's preacher math for you. It's add the two to one together, you get three, and if you add the introduction, it's actually four, but if I say to you two, it feels like a shorter sermon's on the way. (laughs) 
two points are these. One, your God's workmanship, and two, your destiny is incredibly bright. We need to understand, here's why these, these points matter. We need to understand that we're God's workmanship because it frees us from the sort of never-ending, tyrannical loop of, of self-analyzing and self-psychologizing. Gets us out of ourselves when we know it, that, that we can hand ourselves over to God. We're His workmanship. And we need to know that we have a destiny because it's the only way to actually step confidently into whatever we're facing. And until we know we have a destiny, then we can't walk by faith into the next thing. We can't, in other words, be energized by the, the grace of God knowing that what we're standing in right now, what we're living through right now is part of the plan. It's part of the destiny. So these two things together are powerful. And uh, let's take them one at a time. You are God's workmanship. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created, that's strong language, created in Christ Jesus. Now, in our last sermon from verses 8 and 9, we were left standing on the edge of our empty grave of our former deadness to God and, and you know, looking into the eyes of the risen Jesus with only God's grace to account for the fact that we're no longer in the grave. Now, here in verse 10, we begin to explore our new life in Christ, and we begin with this astonishing, reassuring fact. We are His workmanship. Now, the phrase, uh, His workmanship, refers also, it's speaking back to verse 9, which tells us that our salvation, verses 8 and 9, are not a result of works. So, not a result of our works, that is, but somebody was at work for us to come out of that grave, for us to come alive to God, it just wasn't us. A work has taken place, but it's not our work. One of the ways I think about it is that if you drive past one of the many construction sites in downtown Nashville, you'll notice uh, a sign on the fence of that construction site that tells you the name of the builder. And it's just the same way for everyone who has come alive to Jesus Christ. There's a sign on our soul. It says, God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's what's most true about you. But of course, someone will say, I don't know if that's really true about me. If I'm God's construction site, then why does my life look like it's in the blasting phase? Well, maybe it is. Is that so bad? We all know that you can't build up unless you dig deep. And God always builds up. I can't read a verse like this without thinking about something that C.S. Lewis said someplace. I really do try to restrain my C.S. Lewis quotes. But this is just too on point. Lewis says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You know that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The answer is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. I love that. Friends, our lives might be in the demolition phase But through faith in Jesus Christ, we are right now in this very moment, no matter what else is happening, God's workmanship. And it's worth reflecting on the fact that if we discover in ourselves a desire to love Jesus, a desire to learn from Jesus, a desire to live for Jesus, then the only way to account for that desire inside of us is that God is on the inside at work. You weren't born with it. You were by nature a child of wrath, but a new nature has entered in. A new creation has begun, and it's the only way to account for the fact that you're here this morning. Now, 
Now, I want to speak to two different groups of people right now. Those who are new to following Jesus or those who are maybe here because you're thinking about following Jesus. And then um, I want to speak to those of us who are old hat. Now, I don't mean like chronologically old. I mean, we've just been at this a while. But we might also be chronologically old. You get the point. To those of us who are new to following Jesus, um, I want to say don't be surprised if things seem to get messier on on the inside the nearer that you get to Jesus. If you're thinking about following Jesus, don't be surprised that as you sort of move in proximity to him, the more you just see about yourself that's out of alignment. There are locked doors inside of us all. And the thing about inviting Jesus in, to use the language of Revelation chapter three, you know, Jesus is knocking on the door. The thing about inviting Jesus into our interiority is that he is determined to beautify every room, every floor, even the foyer inside of us with a kind of resurrection glory. And as C.S. Lewis pointed out, it can feel like an abominable knocking about. And here's what I wanna say about that. You can trust Jesus to go knocking about inside of you. He knows how to restabilize a bruised reed. He knows how to blow into a flame the, the barely kindled wick of your faith. He knows how to restore souls. You can trust him. Continuous, simple opening up to Jesus is the best therapy in the universe. Now, to those of us who are old hat, here's a temptation particular to us. We might call it the oughtness temptation. It's the temptation that says, I ought to be further along by now. I ought to be more mature than this. I ought to be free of this anxiety by now. For Pete's sake, I'm God's workmanship. I ought to be doing better than this. And along with that temptation comes this thought. What will it say about God if people see my real need? I, who have been following Jesus for so long, who have taught others to follow Jesus, won't my honesty make him look bad? To that temptation and to that question, we must give a resounding no. My honesty will show that Jesus is the mighty Savior he claims to be. My honesty right now in this moment, having followed Jesus for so long, will show that God goes the distance with the work that he begins. I wonder if some of you older saints in the Lord who've been walking, you've seen some stuff, been walking with Jesus for a long time, I wonder if you realize that one of the greatest gifts you have to give to the generations behind you is your honesty about your sins, your failings, your doubts, your struggles, your need. It glorifies God. We won't always have our present sins and failings, but we're never gonna grow out of our need of God. Maturity in Christ is not needing God less. It's trusting Him more. And however long we walk with God, the key to following is just staying open. So, um, you know, you might be facing today sickness or financial ruin or despair or aimless prosperity. But whatever you're enduring, you know, whether, whether it's of your own making or whether it's the making of others, it cannot change this deeply encouraging fact. We don't have to sort ourselves out. 
We can stop grubbing about on the inside. We can stop psychoanalyzing. We are God's workmanship now. And we can get on with our destiny. That's number two. Your destiny is incredibly bright. Look at the middle of the verse with me. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I love this. For good works which God prepared beforehand. Now it would be difficult to overstate the significance of that three letter word right in the middle of the verse. For, for, created in Christ Jesus for something. I was watching a reality show with a famous actor recently, which is not something I normally do, but the show seemed honest and it intrigued me. And in the episode, this famous actor was looking back on his very successful career and he was asking at one point, when is enough enough? Which is just another way of saying, what's it all for? And one advantage I think that celebrities have over, over us is having many of them achieved what it is they were after in life only to find and end up with this question, what's it for? It's not enough to be successful. We have to know what it's for and that means all of us cannot live without a sense of destiny. We need to know that our lives are for something. Why? Because people like us who are made in the image of God cannot flourish until we know what it's for without a destination for our lives. We, we, we have no heading. We're listless. We're unanchored. We, we can't thrive. And that's why despite the growing evidence of our minusculeness in the vast expanse of space, we're looking to the stars, many of us, to try to find a meaning for our life. Because we all believe, or at least we want to, that our lives are meaningful beyond this world. And they are. No one believes that more about your life than Jesus does. No one believes more in human destiny and meaningfulness than Jesus. We're so prone to think of Jesus as a kind of, you know, Jesus the killjoy, Jesus the pragmatic, Jesus the austere, Jesus the prude. But nothing could be further from the truth. I can prove it to you. Art, beauty, literature, adventure, all of these come from the heart of God. For Pete's sake, penguins, kangaroos, the Grand Canyon. A kangaroo looks like an accident, doesn't it? <laughs> that came out of the heart of God. And you know, how exciting it is, how deeply comforting it is to know that we're made for something by a God who makes things like that. There's nothing boring, bare, uninspiring about a destiny in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we're not ornaments on God's shelf, you know, collecting dust. We're participants in God's good work of redemption, so much so that we can get out of bed every day, put our feet on the floor and say, I was made for this. I was made for this day. I remember recently I was taking one of my daughters to get some kind of a treat and I said, are you ready to go? And she said, I was born for this. <laughs> yes, you were. But it gets even better than that. Not only do we have a destiny in Christ, but we can know that our destiny is incredibly bright because the good works which God intends for us have been prepared. Isn't that an amazing word? Prepared. Prepared beforehand. When beforehand? Like when you were born? No. We know from chapter one, the apostle Paul is looking way back to eternity past and he's saying that built into reality is a plan. You cannot be predestined for salvation without being predestined to a destiny that matters in Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, there's an expression that's popular everywhere. I really like it. Cometh the man, cometh the hour. You know, in Jesus Christ, that's actually true. This hour, right now, you know, November the 20th, 2022, at 1136, God determined that you would be sitting in that chair hearing this gospel, I hope receiving this encouragement so that you walk out those doors more energized, more enthused 
with a sense of your destiny in Christ than ever before. He designed it that way. You were ordained for this moment. He, he could have put you at any time in, in human history. He chose this time for you. It's tempting, isn't it, to feel as if we're sort of bouncing around like pinballs inside of a chaos machine called 2022. Don't buy it. If we're bouncing around, and we often are, it's only the bumpers of divine sovereignty sort of directing our course, making our lives fruitful. And I know that when I say that, some of us, we feel as if we've gone irreparably off course in our lives, like there was this better version of our life that could have been, and here we are settling for like the third or fourth or fifth or hundredth tier down of the life that we could have had. But it cannot be true because down beneath our derailments, the unavoidable ones and the avoidable ones are the everlasting arms of God working out all things for our good and for his glory. God's out ahead of us preparing the way, which means that we have everything to live for in Christ. The world is like teeming with opportunities to glorify and enjoy God. There are billions of people who want to know Jesus. They just don't know it yet. There are billions of ways to lift the nobility, as Francis Grimke used to say, to lift the nobility of the human race for the glory of God. So much so, I I have to admit that it can be overwhelming just to know where to begin. And I get that question a lot. You know, I don't know what to do. So I I just built out this whole point to answer that question. Number three, how do we find our way into our destiny? And and I'm thinking especially of these words right here, these six words, that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. We discover our destiny like this. By choosing, that's a real category in the Bible. Choosing a God-glorifying heading. And then, walking that way. (laughs) And there's hardly a better place to demonstrate the point than the life of the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter. The Apostle Paul had a heading. He knew why he was on the planet. He tells us that he wants to preach the gospel where no one else has preached it. He wants to show up and preach the gospel where nobody's heard the name of Jesus before. And they're looking at him like, what, who are you even talking about? All right, and, and in his mind, that means he's got to get to the ends of the earth, which everybody thought around that time was Spain. So he's got to go through Rome. And he actually says to the Romans, I've often intended to come to you. And he tells them that he, he expects that they're going to strengthen him and then that he's going to move on. I've often intended to come to you, he says, but thus far have been prevented. Prevented by whom? By God. So he's got a a trajectory, he's got a heading, he's headed for that heading, and then he gets shipwrecked. A couple times. And he gets thrown in prison. Probably more than a couple of times. He gets beaten. A lot. And at no point does the Apostle Paul say, well, you know, I should probably change my heading. No, because you have to have a heading in order to get anywhere. So the Apostle Paul deeply receives these two things, that by the grace of God, underneath the sovereignty of God, we choose a heading that, we, that just resonates with us. We just want to do it. I mean, think about this. God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he tells them to name the animals the first scientific act. And then, he, you know, he tells them to basically rule over creation and be fruitful and multiply. And he doesn't give many instructions beyond that. Uh, Tony Shepard and I were talking about this recently, our director of assimilation, that there's literally a trillion right answers. There's all the right answers in the world for Adam and Eve except for one. And I don't have to tell you how that works out. God is not, you know, looking at us and thinking, you know, well, uh, yeah, don't choose that one. I mean, there's so many ways to live from. What resonates with you? What's bubbling up in your heart? What do you want to do for his glory? Head that way. And then expect derailments. That we should walk in them. All right, so we're just walking along. 
we're discovering our destiny. Oftentimes, through derailments, for instance, the Apostle Paul shipwrecked. And as if that's not bad enough, he gets out, everybody's cold, so he starts a fire, and a snake comes out and bites him on the hand. Now, let's be real. Many of us at that moment would be tempted to think, I have gone terribly wrong somewhere. I've just been shipwrecked, and I was literally bitten by Satan's minion. We all know there's not going to be snakes in the new creation, or cilantro. <laughs> it's not actually meant for human consumption. I think it's, I think it's actually a weed. <laughs> He's thinking, you know, he, he might die. He's bit by a viper. He might die. It might be the end. He's thinking, well, this is, this is where the Lord has me. He doesn't die. Everybody there is, you know, sort of looking at, looking at these crazy apostles and thinking, what's going on with these guys? And they preach the gospel and a whole bunch of people come to follow Jesus. So Paul has a trajectory. He's constantly derailed. And as a result, churches are built and people find their way into the grace of God. And that's not just the way an apostle lives. That's your life. You choose a heading that you, that you know would be pleasing to God and then you receive the derailments as the will of God and along the way you find yourself stumbling into fruitfulness that you did not anticipate. That's what it looks like to be led by God. And it's the best life there is to live. You have in Jesus Christ a share in the only project that will finally matter, the re-beautifying of the human race to the glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's get after it. Let's stand and worship God.